Hello, I'm Paul Anderson and welcome to this edition of The Forum, brought to you from the European Parliament in Strasbourg as a co-production between Europol TV and PBS, the public service broadcaster of Malta. Hello, and I'm Daphne Kassar from PBS Malta. Malta is the smallest member of the European Union, a Mediterranean island of just 400,000 people. It joined the EU in 2004 and now has six MEPs in the European Parliament. So it's a good case study for today's topic of discussion, the influence of small countries in the European Union or the lack of it. OK, let's go straight to the four MEPs who will steer us through those questions. Uh, Roberta Metzola from Malta and the European People's Party here in Parliament, a very warm welcome. And Robert Ziele from Latvia, another small European nation uh, from the European Conservatives and Reformists. Hello. Marlene Mitzi, another MEP from Malta, representing the Socialists and Democrats in Parliament. And last, but by no means least, Jürgen Kreutzmann from Germany and is from the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats. Let's set the mood first and ask whether the voting balances have been sufficiently corrected now, bearing in mind the respective populations of member states. Marlene Mitze, do you feel now, or as from the 1st of November this year, that you will have a stronger voice as a, as a representative of a small nation? Well, um, yes, the Lisbon Treaty has actually uh, redefined voting systems. And obviously, as a small country, you're always to a degree uh, at a disadvantage. But as was, uh, as the introduction said, obviously, there is, it, it, it's an initiative to, to make up, to make uh, uh, alliances with other countries. Um, if you want your, your voice to be heard, you know, it has to be four, four countries, one million, one million uh, members of one million population. So, so yes, there is pros and cons like everything else. Robert, you also come from a very small country, Latvia. I'm not really sure the double majority principle of starting from November will work in a, in, a, in a favor of the smaller country. Why, if you remember recently seven years budget, multi, multi annual financial framework, at the end, prime ministers had to choose one priority, and the co coalitions between smaller countries was not so easy to establish. It's a fresh example, I think. Roberta, what is your take on the situation? How do you feel that uh, the voice of just 400,000 people can be heard in the European Union? In my 10 months experience as a member of this parliament, I have learned that the size of the country is not a factor in the amount of influence that you can affect, that you can influence. It is according to the member of the European, of the party that you are a member of in the European Parliament. It is a matter of networking. It is a matter of getting through your ideas in order to convince others and pull the same, the same line. And I think that that is something that, uh, that over the past 10 months has shown that it is not the size of the country, it is not the number of members of the European Parliament, it is actually how, how strong you can be in making your case. And finally, uh, Jürgen Kreutzmann, you come from the biggest, um, the biggest uh, country in the European Union. How do you uh, feel about these changes and in particular uh, this point that it will become easier for smaller nations to block initiatives they don't yeah, like? Yeah, we have a blocking minority in the future that uh, four member states representing 35% uh, of the EU population can have a block. That is very important, though you, you need an alliance. But I can um, underline uh, what my colleague from the EBP said. Uh, this is my, my experience too, a five-year experience, when you, uh, the only uh, parliament, the European parliament, where you has, as an individual, has such a big influence. Another, uh, I have experience in the state parliament, I know how the national parliament is working. When you are in a government, everybody thinks you should agree what the government is doing. We say the hands to the heaven, so you should agree. When you are in the opposition, you are working for the basket. But in the European Parliament, as an individual, you can influence whether you will be the rapporteur or you will be the shadow rapporteur. The rapporteurs with the shadow rapporteurs have a big influence on a dossier, and that is very important. So it seems to me what you said also, it's a question how you uh, have a good uh, 
um, workers, good, good uh, people who are working for you. Uh, that is very important. And that you, how, how hard you are working, that you make a lot of amendments, then you can influence all the dossiers. And does this mean that you, coming from Germany, would listen with particular attention to the views of people from uh, MEPs and colleagues from Latvia and from Malta? Yeah, sure, because you are working in the committees very close. You have in the systems the rapporteur and all the other political groups that have a shadow rapporteurs. And they uh, try to come to compromise amendments and you work together. Uh, whatever uh, you are, uh, belong to one of the groups, um, the, the aim, the target is uh, to find a solution. And then you need uh, three uh, institutions, the Commission, you need the Parliament, and at the end you need also the Council. And that is very important. And when you have a blocking manager, we, we see that in the moment when we are discussing the made-in, the labeling of made-in. We have a blocking majority of the big member states like Germany, but also of the smaller member states, we have also blocking well, minority. Nothing is moving on the um, on this um, uh, product safety uh, directive. We're going to have the opportunity to discuss these issues very in detail and later during the program. But first, let's watch a short clip prepared by a colleague, Maria Maggiore, and it gives an overview of the views from Brussels from some people with a very big interest in this question. In a union of 28 countries, how can you defend your interests when you represent an island with 400,000 inhabitants, compared to a country of 80 million? And yet, that's what happens in the European Union. Each decision is the result of a compromise, of balances of power and alliances. It is not that easy when you are a small country. However, it's important for a small country to really uh, choose the areas where we want to um, make an impact. So we cannot fight each and every battle. I mean, you know, uh, countries like Germany have, and, and France, they have a, a, a proposal for many of the issues on the table. The system operating in the council up until now gave a number of votes to each country. 29 for the four largest, Germany, France, the United Kingdom and Italy. 27 for Spain and Poland about 10 for the medium-sized countries, between 7 and 4 for the small-sized, going down to 3 for Malta. A qualified majority requires 260 votes and 15 countries. You can understand how the big players often impose their world vision on the rest of the group. From 1st of November 2014, a new voting system will come into operation, that of the double majority. It will require only 55% of countries as a qualifying majority. Each country, whether large or small, will have one vote, but they must represent 65% of the population of Europe. For uh, small and medium-sized uh, countries like mine, uh, it will be apparently easier to uh, block uh, things um, because the numbers are set the way they are. Until now, 93 votes were required to block a decision. From November, you'll just need at least four countries representing a minimum 35% of the population. Is this a more democratic system at last? Maria Maggiore there. Her last point was in fact a big rhetorical question. Will it be more democratic after November? Jürgen Kreutzmann, what's your answer to that? If you look at the functioning of the Council, not the Parliament. We'll come to that in, in due course. Yeah, what you should do generally within Europe, we should look that every member state, we should unite, we should include in the decisions every member state, whether it's big or is a small one. Because um, otherwise, um, you, when you dominate the smaller ones, uh, the interest uh, of the population, also the government, is not so big. And you need all the uh, member states, whether are, they are big theory, or not. But big states aren't prepared to do that. I and mean, you only have to look at the yeah, tendency you, for intergovernmental agreements to see that they want their yeah, own way. That, that the intergovernmental agreements are not a good way, because um, then you have the domination of the big member states like Germany and France, and they say, we decide that. 
perhaps uh, they invite uh, Great Britain, everything is done. So I'm very in favor not to have uh, intergovernment uh, regulations. We should have uh, the European Parliament, we should have the Commission, and we should have the Council. All the three institutions should work together. And in the moment when they are working together, you are, uh, have a, a, a target which every three institutions will, will, will have or will reach. And that is very important. That's why you are talking about compromises. That is very um, uh, important also for the smaller member states. And you must also see sometimes the interests are very different. For example, fishery, that could be an issue for Malta, but not so for Germany, I would say, or for, for Spain, I have learned. So uh, you have to see that you have different uh, interests in different member states. And when a member state um, has a big interest, they need alliances uh, to, to come uh, to a good solution for this uh, Robert, member state. Uh, you are limited by the number of, uh, of MEPs that Malta is represented by in, in the European Parliament. Obviously, it comes down to size, six MEPs, and you are restricted in the representation on various committees. Uh, how do you feel that you can influence decision-making on those committees where you are not representing? And that amounts to almost half of the committees here at the European Parliament. Well, first of all, a Maltese MEP represents uh, um, far less uh, citizens uh, um, than, than a German MEP, so to, to make a comparison. A Maltese MEP represents 80,000 uh, um, uh, citizens, while a German MEP represents 800,000. So that already puts it into context as to where Maltese MEPs come from and what are the numbers. As regards influencing committees, yes, you are right. Um, there are many committees in which currently there is not one Maltese member of the European Parliament. There are committees, for example, where there are two Maltese members of the European Parliament. I believe that this could be remedied, um, especially in, for the, in the next legislature, we are now coming closer to an election, where there could be an agreement between all six members of the European Parliament who will be elected as to spread the number and the representation of MEPs better throughout the committees. With regards to those committees where you don't have a representation, I come from the European People's Party. There, are, there is always a big component of the EPP in a committee where there is no Maltese MEP. What I do is, if there is a cause that is important for Malta, I contact the coordinator for the party in the committee and I make sure that the Maltese interests are represented in his, uh, in his work. And that takes a lot of time. However, if you have a good team, as Mr. Kreutzmann said before, you can manage. And I have done it, for example, I am not a member of the Transport Committee. However, when the Malta Air Traffic Controllers Association wanted me to push forward their cause, I did it by pushing it with my fellow EPP MEPs in that committee. Robert Ziele, you have a slightly larger number of MEPs. What do you see, give me some examples here, what do you see as the key issues that you want to represent on behalf of your people, either Latvia or, or, or the <coughs> neighbors? Of course, so I am elected in Latvia. I think as everybody elected in their own country, at the same time, those who are saying that they are representing Europe in their own country, it's, it's not true, I think. That's why, uh, in case of Latvia, we have actually from nine MEPs, we have a three who are not cooperating with other six. It's a long story about this purely pretty national issue as well. Uh, with Russian-speaking uh, well, uh, MEPs and, and Latvian. No, but Latvians also who are um, uh, part of those parties and in coalition government as well, we are re really splitting in a different committees, not overlapping, so that we can cover more substantial committees. My experience in 10 years, I'm, uh, I'm 10 years coordinator for my groups in transport committee, which was uh, my previous job as a minister of transport. And also econ, well, I used to be also minister of, of finance before that. And, and, and my experience shows one, if it's really crucial legislation, and if it's not against, uh, if my country interests and Baltic state interests, for example, in transport sector and port directive or in service directive, is not against the big country's interests, then I can succeed with my authority in the committee. But if it's really against the, sorry, German or French interests, I will lose. What about all small countries together as a kind of grand coalition, or is that impractical because the issues are too diverse? It was, it was, from my memories, it's a service directive some years ago, I think, the previous legislature, 
which was not only small countries against the big countries, but Eastern Europe, in some sense, against the Western Europe. And it doesn't matter if the socialists or conservatives, yeah. because employers and employees were on the one side, in that case, to, not to create a real competition in the service market. And we lost. Eastern Europe lost, with a, almost with the same number of, of re representation that you can see in the parliament. I don't remember exact uh, figures, but it was West against the East. That's, the that's politics. The problem <laughs> is that you have in different member states different cultures and you have different institutions. For example, in Germany, the um, uh, trade unions are very strong. You know, we have yeah. the so-called Mitbestimmung. Other member states don't know that. And then when you have another culture, um, you, are, you have another point of view when you are decide on this. The uh, new member states have not this. Uh, they, uh, they have a new, uh, yeah, they are new countries. They uh, have not these old, uh, let's say, old institutional uh, things. And though they are, an other, uh, they are looking at the issue from very other point, standpoint. And that is sometimes the difference uh, you have uh, in the discussion. Robert, you mentioned culture. Is it true that uh, decision making and maybe the persuasion process during that phase, uh, there is a natural affinity between countries in various zones? For example, is there a northern southern divide or an eastern western divide? Is, is that real? Well, I, I joined this parliament um, after having spent eight years in the Council of Ministers representing Malta. And I think in the Council there was a stronger Northern-South divide. I'll give you one example on immigration. There it was beyond the culture. You had the geographic loca location of, uh, of the southern member states that had, let's say, a common aim or a common position. Um, that the Dublin regulation should be revised. There you could find an affinity with whether um, a minister or a representative was from Spain or from Greece or from Italy. In the European Parliament, when I joined here, we had, uh, for example, a cross-party resolution on immigration where the positions that had been expressed by the southern member states in the Council were being expressed by MEPs from all, the from all the parties and from all the countries. So I think that in the European Parliament, it is more the issues that join you together. It is more, perhaps, the political individuals or the political uh, political ideology that pits you perhaps against another person but then when it is an issue that joins that joins um, um, a cause a common cause like for example on immigration I think in Parliament there is not such a divide I'm going to float one more question for everybody do you think that it's right the weighting of voting that goes on um, in the European Council uh, to, 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 make, to make that uh, according to population and according to majority, or should there also be a case, as exam for example with uh, Luxembourg, which is a very wealthy country, that economic power should be taken into account as well? Is there a case to alter the criteria by which uh, the voting rights are allocated? Let's go around the table. Roberta first. Well one other example. Malta managed to successfully um, get all the other member states to, to locate the European Asylum Support Office in Malta. That had nothing to do with our size, that it had nothing to do with the fact that we only had three votes in the Council, but all other member states agreed. I would say that moving away from the weighting of votes or the numbers, let's continue to believe in the possibility of small countries to punch above their weight as Malta has done so far. Okay, Robert Cilio, Well, I, I, am, I am against uh, to take economic criteria in case in Luxembourg, which is by, by number of people also a very small country. Luxembourg is gaining anyway, but they have a several commission, uh, presidents of commission, perhaps they, they will get again. Yeah, that is a very special situation with Luxembourg. But in general, I, I, I'm not very in favor in the future that we will vote against something and block against something. Uh, well, in council level, as in parliament level, we have to find as much compromise as possible without uh, putting pressure, because what is good for Malta cannot be bad for Europe. Marlene? Right, well, yeah, the, the weighting system would tend to disadvantage smaller countries, obviously. Um, and having three votes um, at the moment is, is what it is, basically. Rather than rather than trying to divide countries by the number of votes, 
I would rather go and see what the common interest is between the countries. This is the, this is the, this is the spirit of the union, basically. Obviously, there will be differences, but um, I would go f more for, let's see which and what interests each individual country, because the interests of each individual, individual countries, in the end, affects the whole club. And we'll give the final words to Jürgen. I would, I would say when you would take mm -hmm. the economic power as for decision making, you would uh, split, uh, you divide Europe. You never could do that because we we don't have um, equal uh, equal possibilities or equal uh, treatment in the different member states. Though what you need is you have to unite the weaker ones and the stronger ones uh, should bring solidarity to help the weaker ones. And when the weaker ones get stronger. Europe gets stronger. We have to leave it there. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Roberta Metzola from the EPP and from Malta. Robert Ziele from the European Conservatives and Re Reformers from Latvia. Thank you both very much indeed. Thank you. Marlene Metzi, um, MEP from Malta representing the Socialists and Democrats in Parliament. And also Jürgen Kreutzmann from Germany from the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats. Thank you for joining us. And thank you for me, Paul Anderson from Europol TV as well.